So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Jonathan Hall. This is my first time to attend a software circus event. Um, so thanks for having me and thanks for letting me present. Um, in my day job, I'm kind of a Go developer um, and a slash SRE, I kind of do both uh, at the moment, um, working for a freelance contract and uh, that'll be ending the end of the year. So if you know of anybody who needs a Go developer or SRE, reach out to me, please. Um, and I've been using Go for about four or five years, I think. Um, and my presentation isn't doing what I want. And I've been using Couch to be about the same amount of time, about four or five years. And these two uh, interests overlap where uh, I wrote a, a library called Kivik, which is a Go, uh, it's the most popular Go uh, client library or SDK for CouchDB. There were a few others that existed, but they had been very outdated. They didn't have some of the new features. Um, so I wrote my own when I needed one. And uh, so that, that's kind of where, uh, yeah, where those two interests meet. Um, I'm also a member of the CouchDB Project Management Committee, which doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, it means I get to vote on certain questions like should we deprecate features or should we add new features? Um, and I'm one of the, I would say two uh, main maintainers of the CouchDB documentation. So I don't actually code on CouchDB itself. I'm not an Erlang developer, which is the language it's written in. Um, but I do write the Go SDK for it, and I update the documentation. I'm mostly the grammar Nazi for the documentation. I also live near Amsterdam. Uh, this is mainly just an excuse to put a photo of a red Amsterdam sofa on the slideshow. This slideshow, by the way, is uh, adapted from a training I recently did, an online training I did for O'Reilly through their uh, their online training platform. Um, I just cut out all of the uh, live coding examples and stuff and just kind of doing the intro, expanded version of the intro to talk about what CouchDB is. So the agenda today, uh, I'm going to talk about what is CouchDB, obviously. Um, that, that probably shouldn't be on there. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use CouchDB, but that's not the main point. Um, yeah, I should have replaced how to use CouchDB with uh, why, why to use CouchDB. Um, and then a few links and some topics for anybody who's interested some places you might uh, you might go afterwards to, to find more information. So diving right in, what is CouchDB? Well, first is an acronym, that's an easy answer. It stands for Cluster of Unreliable Commodity Hardware. Uh, I, I guess when CouchDB was, was new, uh, the idea of throwing a bunch of crappy hardware at a problem was kind of sexy. Uh, nowadays, maybe that's not as true, but the acronym sticks around. So essentially the idea is you could set up some some commodity hardware as opposed to like super expensive servers. You could put them in a server rack somewhere, you could set up 10 of them and they would all work as a cluster of unreliable hardware. If any three of those nodes crashed, your data would still be fine. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the idea behind the name. At a little bit higher level, uh, CouchDB is a non-relational or sometimes called NoSQL database. I really hate that term because you could actually use SQL to query CouchDB if you want, but um, yeah, it's unrelational. So rather than having columns and rows, you have documents of arbitrary JSON data. Uh, CouchDB offers a seamless multi-master sync, which is one of the, uh, when we dive into it, we'll talk about more that, uh, I'll talk about that in more detail momentarily, but that's kind of the killer feature of CouchDB. And it provides a mostly standards compliant HTTP JSON REST-ish API, uh, which means it's really easy to, to program against, which kind of means that the, the SDK I wrote for Go isn't actually that interesting. Um, it's just a fancy front end in front of some REST calls basically. So I'm gonna talk a little bit here about, um, to, to, to sort of paint the picture of where CatchDB fits on the database landscape, so to speak, I'm going to talk about relational versus non-relational, and then I'm going to talk about some other dimensions of databases. So um, I, I would imagine most of you, or at least those of you who have done software development are familiar with relational databases. You probably use MySQL or Microsoft uh, SQL Server or Postgres or something like that, uh, which stores data in rows and columns. Um, this is even true if you're using a more uh, you know consumer-facing 
database like Microsoft Access, even though it, it doesn't really have a SQL interface or, or it's not as popular, um, it still uses a relational mindset. Um, yeah, most, most, not all, use SQL or some version of SQL uh, to query data. Um, and, and their data relationships in a relational database, this is, this is actually the, the, where the name comes from, of course, their, the relationships are defined um, with foreign keys. And um, so you could say this table refers to, th th this, this column in this table refers to something in that table. And if that item doesn't exist in that table, you can't create it here, et cetera. So strictly defined relationships is, is really what defines a relational database. And these databases are broadly speaking, best for normalized data, complex relationships, and ACID, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, ACID requirements. And here's a bunch of examples. There's many, many more, um, but if you've used one of these databases, you are accustomed to, or you, you are familiar with a relational database. In contrast, uh, non-relational databases, um, are, th this list is more of things, a list of things that databases aren't, which is, makes it harder to discuss, but data is not stored in tables. Uh, how it exactly is stored is, is a little bit open for interpretation or, or depending on the implementation. Um, a common uh, pattern you'll see in databases like MongoDB or CouchDB is that you have documents. Um, others sort of just keep blobs like maybe Redis, or you could even think of, uh, of like a, an Amazon or a Google bucket as a non-relational database. It just stores a, a blob of bytes. Um, and then you also have graph databases and, and other types of more sophisticated da databases that store other more sophisticated types of relationships. But the point is that they don't store columns and rows of data. And uh, there's no standard query language. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think each, each database that falls out of this category, whether you're using Redis or Mongo or Cassandra, each one's gonna kind of have its own proprietary uh, query format or language. Um, and then, yeah, data relationships typically are not defined in the database, although that depends. I mean, a, a graph database keeps uh, relationships of some sort in the database. Um, and these databases are, broadly speaking, best for arbitrary data, uh, complex data, and flexibility. Um, in, in, the, in the course I did for O'Reilly, we did an exercise where we talked about a bunch of different use cases and, and when they would fit, whether they fit better for a, a relational or non-relational database. And the truth is almost all types of data could fit in either one. And often the choice is a matter of opinion or, or preference rather than um, some strict technical uh, reason. And here are some popular examples of non-relational databases. Uh, Mongo is probably the most popular, most famous one. Redis is up there too. Um, and then all these others, uh, uh, are, are, are popular too. A quick note on CouchDB versus CouchBase, because this is a question that I expect will come up uh, at the end, I'll just answer it now. Um, they used to have a common code base and then CouchBase went off to start a commercial venture um, and they've changed their API since then. So they are no longer compatible. Although CouchBase does provide, I, I believe that I, I've never used CouchBase, but I believe they provide a mobile SDK that can synchronize with CouchDB um, so that there's a there's a certain level of rudimentary compatibility between them, but for the most part, they think of them as completely unrelated products. The relationship between Couchbase and CouchDB is the same as that between Java and JavaScript. So ACID. Um, I imagine many of you are at least vaguely familiar with what ACID is in in the database terminology, but we're going to go through it quickly. It's an acronym that stands for Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. In a nutshell, it's it's just a guarantee or a set of guarantees that your data will always be available or you'll get an error. In other words, you won't get some sort of weird inconsistent partial data when you query your database. Um, so that this is obviously useful in, in a large number of applications. It's also kind of the default that we assume when we're dealing with databases most of the time. Uh, at least that's my experience in dealing with, with new developers. They kind of assume that their data is just always uh, always correct and always available, or that it's down. Like if the server's physically offline, they don't expect to get a response. But they expect if they're able to talk to, the, to, their, to MySQL that they should get a valid response. 
and the idea of race conditions and um, atomic commits and so on, uh, it, it kind of, it, it, it doesn't come natural uh, for, for people to think about this uh, most of the time. Um, but an ACID database, when you use transactions, uh, they kind of guarantee that, that uh, all the changes you're making simultaneously happen simultaneously. And a, a really simple textbook example, of course, is uh, a transaction with a bank. Um, if I'm gonna send money to Sam, um, the withdrawal from my account needs to happen simultaneous to the, in, to the, uh, to the deposit in his account. If they happen, if mine happens first and then something happens, some, something breaks, then that money just disappears. Or if the opposite happens, if the deposit in his account happens before my is withdrawn and something breaks, then suddenly an extra amount of money just appeared into the universe uh, out of thin air. So it's really important for a transaction like that to happen atomically. So that's what ACID is designed to, to guarantee. And most non-relational databases, including CatchDB, do not support uh, transactions, or, or at least their support is incredibly limited. Um, so they require a different approach. But with CouchDB, if 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 our if Sam and I use a bank that uses CouchDB as their back end, uh, I don't envy those developers writing the software that makes sure that that transaction happens at exactly the right moment. That uh, you know, it's just it's a lot trickier to do that. CouchDB. There are there are ways to accomplish it uh, that are kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but it's it's complicated. Then there's an alternative, which I actually just learned about while preparing these slides, and it's called BASE. <laughs> it stands for Basic Availability, Soft State, and Eventual Consistency. And I think it's an over-engineered acronym, but I'm running with it anyway. Uh, it provides looser guarantees than ACID. Um, it's also not a, exactly an opposite of ACID. It's not like you can have it. It's not appropriate to say that a database is either ACID or BASE. You could, it could be potentially neither or it could have aspects of both. But in a nutshell, whereas ACID prevents data conflicts, BASE allows for conflicts, but guarantees that they will eventually be resolved. So if the bank that Sam and I use for transactions is using a BASE database, then, then even though I check my account now and I see that my money's gone and he checked it and it's not there yet, we can at least rest assured that at some point in the future, it might be in 13 seconds, it might be in six years, but at some point in the future, our, our account balances will be correct. So if we have a database that follows the base model, that eventual consistency is guaranteed. The, the time frame is not necessarily. A particular database may provide time guarantees, but the, the base acronym itself doesn't do that. So I wanted to talk about briefly about some of where some of these different databases fit. So I showed a previous in a previous slide, uh, relational versus non-relational. Now in this dimension, uh, it's it's not a clean cut. You know, it's it's many relational databases fit under ACID and non-relational under base, but it's not as clean cut as you might imagine. So here's a list. These are all ACID databases um, or, or they, they can under right configurations provide ACID guarantees. Now on the base side, actually, I wanted to bring up something that's not traditionally considered a, a database at all. Um, Bitcoin or, 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 uh, or any sort of blockchain and Git both fall under this category. They both provide eventual consistency, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about that they, they provide many of the same characteristics that databases can. And then uh, most of these databases I showed on the previous slide, Mongo, Cassandra, Couchbase, um, but Redis, interestingly, is actually over here on the ACID side. So it's a non-relational database, but it does provide transactional support. So uh, if you need that particular mix of uh, features, then Redis might be something to consider. And then CouchDB and PouchDB fit over here on the base side, more or less. Now, I want to point out that, that this, is not, uh, this is not the whole picture, um, especially when you start considering multi-server configurations of some of these so-called ACID databases. Um, and if, if you, for example, uh, when I worked at booking.com, we had, we used MySQL for our main data store, but we had a single write master and multiple read replicas. And that was just because a single database server, even on the most expensive hardware available, just couldn't handle the, the volume of traffic. So, so they, all writes went to one node and then that node would replicate those writes out to all the read replicas. So, Although that write master had ACID uh, guarantees, when you consider the system as a whole, it did not. 
it, it had aspects of base. So that this is one one example where uh, it's not an either or. You know, it's not like acid and base are opposites. They they actually kind of overlap and and have strange relationships with, with each other. So uh, you know, in, in that case, to, just to finish out that example, um, when you when you wrote to the to the right master, of course you you would get a response that guaranteed that the right was complete. But if you read the same data from a read replica, you wouldn't be guaranteed that you got the same data. You might have to wait. I think on average it was up to about two seconds there. Uh, but depending on on your configuration, you might wait longer, maybe 15 seconds, for that data to replicate to all the the read replicas. So with, with those two things in mind, um, we're starting to get a view of where CouchDB fits sort of on the database map. Um, it's, it's both non-relational and it fits on the sort of base end of things. Um, but what makes it special? I mean, there's, there's many other databases that fit in both of those categories. So why is CouchDB unique? Well, the, the simple answer is that replication of data is a very hard problem to solve. Now, many of these other databases have solved it in some way or another. Um, Going back to my booking.com example, we solved it with MySQL by having multiple read masters, but that has certain drawbacks. Um, and you know, th there are other, uh, other ways to handle multi-master databases, but they're, they're all, they all have complexity. Um, one, one, one common example is a hot standby server. So maybe you have two MySQL servers uh, and they both receive all, all uh, updates. Um, so that if, if you're, primary server ever crashes, uh, you can just switch over to the hot standby and keep running your business while you go rebuild the, the, the primary server, for example. That, that's one con configuration, uh, but it, it has complexity. I mean, for, for one thing, you, you essentially double your server cost without doubling your performance. You probably actually hurt performance slightly because you have to wait for two servers to do updates, et cetera. Um, you can have a write master and read replicas, which we did at booking.com. Um, Sometimes you get involved with advanced routing protocols so that multiple servers appear to the client to be a single server. And of course, I could go on and on. I'm, I'm sure somebody uh, much more experienced in this could do an entire presentation or, or 10 on the topic of uh, uh, setting up multiple master database systems. One of the key things to keep in mind though about most of these, especially the databases on the ACID side or on the, on the relational side, is that the multi-master capability is usually sort of tacked on to the existing database design. Uh, that, that's practically true of any database where it was designed first to run on a single server, and then the, the need to scale came later and was added later. So that's, that applies to MySQL and Postgres. Um, it probably applies to the Oracle, excuse me, pretty much everything on that side. The only exception I'm aware of on that side is CockroachDB, which was designed from the ground up to be multi-master. Um, but even at, even that one, at some sense, in some sense, the, the replication was added on since they kind of just, uh, borrowed Postgres, um, you know, it's, it's still a Postgres model. It uses the Postgres, uh, client libraries. Um, in contrast, CouchDB is often called a replication protocol with a database tacked on. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier that multi-master sync is sort of the killer feature of CouchDB. You can almost think of it as really the only feature of CouchDB and that data storage is just kind of along for the ride. Uh, so I'll talk more about that um, in the upcoming slides. But before I do, I wanna talk briefly about CAP theorem. CAP theorem says essentially, it is impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide more than two of the following. Consistency which is the, the, which is the fact that uh, you can always read the most recent data. So when I described the, the booking.com example earlier, that was not a consistent scenario. If I could write and then I had to wait two seconds to read, consistency is not guaranteed in that scenario. In, in that particular case, if consistency was required for the client, then we would have to query the, the right master. Availability is the idea that you can always receive some data, even if it may not be the most recent data. And uh, Bitcoin could be an example of that. Uh, you can always check your Bitcoin um, balance or whatever, but you, you may not, you don't necessarily know if, uh, if some transactions have happened on your wallet that, that haven't been recorded yet. And then finally, partition tolerance, which is the idea that if, uh, if some of your, your 
cluster of nodes is failing to work in some way due to a network failure or the server is offline or has crashed, that you can still uh, operate at least to some, ex to some extent. So with this in mind, we can sort of draw this great Venn diagram because what presentation is complete without one? And uh, but basically CAP theorem says that you get to choose any two of these three, but the, the middle X section with the X is, is a logical impossibility. For short, we can call these by their abbreviation CA. And these are all databases that typically fall under the CA uh, category. They provide consistency and availability, but not partition tolerance. Now, strictly speaking, this doesn't fall under the category of, of CAP because CAP assumes a cluster of databases and CA assumes a single node. So if you have a single node, no matter what technology you're using, if you're using CouchDB, if you have a single node, then you're really actually operating under a CA sort of uh, uh, paradigm. And um, of course, many of these can be configured in other configurations, um, as I already mentioned. Uh, so, so if you're using Postgres and you need something other than a CA, you can add, uh, you can add additional nodes and configure them in some way to make it be either a CP or an AP database. And then CP, uh, these databases uh, by default are considered CP databases. So they provide consistency and partition tolerance. So what that means is that if you have, um, yeah, when you query your database, you're guaranteed to get the most recent data. And that even if a node dies, uh, you, uh, yeah, even if a node dies, you can still still query thing. Or, or sorry, no, um, yeah, it doesn't provide availability. So if, if a node dies, then essentially the, the whole the whole system stops working. So you have to all your nodes have to be working. Am I saying that correctly? I might be confusing myself here. Let's move on. And then, uh, yeah, finally, AP, which is where CouchDB fits, and a few others. Um, so these do not provide, do not guarantee consistency, but they do provide availability. So this kind of relates to the base topic we're talking about earlier. But these are databases where uh, you're guaranteed to always get some response, um, and it should continue to work even if you're, if one or more of your servers is offline. But you have no guarantee that what you received is the most recent data. So it really makes these sorts of databases ideal for offline first types of applications. Um, and that's one of the places where CouchDB is, is perhaps most popular. Um, maybe you have a mobile app that needs to synchronize with the server occasionally or something like that. Um, I've, I've heard of uh, people, I remember a few years ago, actually, when uh, there was the big Ebola outbreak in Africa, uh, one of the lead developers on the CouchDB project uh, was helping them uh, with with health tracking, uh, health records for people out in the field uh, where there was very poor internet or no internet, maybe not even good electricity. So they were using mobile phones and tablets to track uh, the health records and they used CouchDB for this because it was great for that where there's an unreliable internet connection. They could keep their their the patient records on their on their iPad. And then when, the, when an internet connection was available, they could synchronize with the central server and share that data with the rest of the world who could then uh, aggregate that data. So that, that's a really good use case. Um, maybe, if, uh, yeah, any sort of mobile app that needs to do uh, data tracking is, is a great use case for this. So um, here I want to, I'm going to assume, I'm speaking to those of you who have used re relational databases, and I want to translate some of the concepts um, before we get a little bit more detailed in, in CouchDB. So in a relational database, you, you have, uh, yeah, for an, you have an SQL query. Uh, in, in CouchDB, instead, you use an HTTP request with, uh, with the JSON payload. A relational database gives you a collection of tables. In CouchDB, you have a collection of databases, just a terminology difference there. And in a relational database, you have rows of data in CouchDB, you have documents. Uh, documents in, in this case are literally just JSON objects. And in a relational database, you have columns. In CouchDB, you have, uh, rather than columns, you have JSON object keys, which can be nested, by the way. Um, and uh, in a relational database, you have whatever data types your database supports. In CouchDB, you have whatever data types JSON supports, so objects, arrays, numbers, et cetera. 
I want to give an example of a CouchDB document, uh, not because I want this to be a really technical talk, but I think it'll help give a little context for the rest of the presentation. So this is just a really simple, silly CouchDB document. Uh, you can see it looks like a JSON object because it is. Um, if we tear it down a little bit, uh, there's two special fields here. We start with an underscore, underscore ID. Uh, that ID is the unique identifier for the document, uh, spaghetti with meatballs. And then the revision, which I'll talk about in a moment, is, uh, yeah, it's the revision of this document. Um, I guess I just described that. Yeah, so this, this revision is a server-generated um, identifier that distinguishes this version of spaghetti with meatballs from any other version of spaghetti with meatballs. And then the rest of the document is just arbitrary data. Um, now, there are a few other system fields that, that can come into play, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. If you're ever interested in learning about CatchDB, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or something. I'm happy to talk about this in more, in more detail. So with that in mind, um, let's talk about the conflict resolution model for CatchDB, because this, this is sort of the, the uh, this is the under, under the hood peak of, of why CatchDB is interesting. So instead of locks, which you, you have in your traditional databases where you can you know, lock for a transaction, for example, CatchDB uses an MVCC uh, approach. Uh, so, so documents are versioned. That's where that revision that we saw a moment ago comes from. The versions are similar to Git. And then the conflict, conflict resolutions are automatic, are automatic and deterministic. Um, think of a CPU cheap version of, of blockchain. So rather than proving some mathematical formula to prove that your that your conflict is the correct one, um, it's a very cheap uh, formula. And in, in fact, the formula is no secret. It's the MD5 sum of the contents of the document. And, and then it's sorted alphanumerically. Um, when necessary, custom or even manual conflict resolution can be built into your app. So if you don't like that alphanumeric sorting of MD5 sums, to do your uh, conflict resolution, you can build your own. Here's a really brief demonstration uh, 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 or, or visual of, of how the two systems work. So on the left here, you see uh, a traditional database which uh, does a, a write. And while that write is happening, all reads are blocked due to a lock until that lock is released. Once it's released, then the reads succeed. In CouchDB instead, uh, there, there is no locking. So the reads continue uh, to read the old version until the write is completed. Once the write is completed, then the new version is available. Here's a, a little bit more involved example. If you imagine a, a music playlist, this is, by the way, from a real world uh, example from the CouchDB documentation. Um, I don't remember the name of the service, but they, they use CouchDB to track uh, playlists in, in user preferences. So imagine that you have uh, your, your uh, here on the left, you have, I guess this, yeah, on the left, you have the, the service that tracks your playlist for you. And it creates a document with revision 1A uh, and replicates that to the user's laptop, I guess. Um, so the user fetches that on their laptop and they have reverse, revision 1A of their playlist. Meanwhile, over on the left, somebody updates that to revision 2A. I don't know if that's another uh, another visitor, maybe that's the, the, the user's uh, spouse has, has updated the playlist. Um, meanwhile, without realizing that the spouse had added some songs, uh, on the, on the right-hand side here, the user on the laptop reorders the songs. And then they push, push revision to B. So now we have a conflict. Uh, we have two, uh, two updates that both happened against revision 1A. Uh, we have 2A and 2B. Which one wins? Um, well, the, the short answer is that CouchDB, when, when these, when these two servers synchronize with each other, or when the laptop synchronizes with the, the service again. Um, both versions are stored. So you have 2A and 2B are both preserved on the server, but one of them is declared the winner. And that's done in a deterministic way, as I said. So essentially the MD5 sum of the document, which everyone happens to sort alphabetically first, is, is declared the arbitrary winner. And, and it's important that's, that that is deterministic so that if you have a cluster of servers, they all have a consensus without having to talk to each other. So, so pr presumably in this application scenario, the, the application author would, would either find some way to resolve this conflict automatically. Maybe it can do some sort of diff comparison and say that, oh, the reordering didn't actually uh, conflict with the, uh, the adding of the new song. So we can just merge them safely, kind of like Git does. Uh, 
or if there's a conflict and maybe it prompts the user says, hey, uh, you and your spouse both updated this, which version do you want to keep or do you want to make a change? So that's up to the application designer, but th those are the options there. The CouchDB API itself uh, just operates a standard web server. Um, early on, in fact, in the CouchDB uh, for an ecosystem, we had this concept of a couch app. Uh, I, I guess it still exists, but it's kind of fallen out of popularity. The idea is that you could upload, upload an entire web application into CouchDB, which you still could. So you, you upload your JavaScript and your HTML files and your images into CouchDB and just serve them directly from CouchDB. Uh, so that, that's a couch app um, and still possible. But I, I think I think since then, uh, web development has come a long way and, and maybe it's not exciting anymore. But uh, it's possible to, to host your entire application inside of CouchDB. Um, it uses standard HTTP verbs, um, content types. If, if you're familiar with, with HTTP and REST, CouchDB will come very naturally to you. I'm not gonna go through this whole slide in detail. I think you get the point. It also uses a standard URL format. Um, so pretty consistently, uh, you refer to, of course, the host and port, then a database, then a document, and then if you have attachments, an attachment. Um, special endpoints, are prefixed with a, an underscore. So uh, you know, any, anytime you see an underscore, you, you probably notice that also in the, in the keys of the document, the underscore ID and underscore rev. Anything that starts with an underscore is basically a, a, J, or a, a CouchDB special thing. Um, so that, that that really makes it simple. I mean, especially if you're if you're reading CouchDB code, you, you can tell automatically very quickly, oh, this is some special endpoint. This isn't some document called all docs. That's a, that's a special endpoint that does something special. Maybe you don't know what it does, but at least you know to go look it up in the documentation. Are there any questions at this point? Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, Sorry, please, I was, please. I, I, so I'm just thinking about the, uh, the Ebola example. I'm thinking that's a really neat example. I Googled it. Um, and also I'm sort of, you know, so I get a little bit about how CouchDB is. And I read, I did read about it and played with it a little bit uh, several mm -hmm. years ago when I was reading the seven database and seven, seven weeks book. So your conflict resolution is based on the ND5 sum. So we're, we're, we're in some, our Ebola region and we get two conflicting uh, updates of someone's health record. Mm -hmm. How did the ND5 sum help with the, the resolution? Is it just one will deterministically beat the other? It may actually be the older health record we've got for that patient or, I mean, deterministic is great because it resolves the conflict. Does that mean we might lose health data in edge cases? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so actually, so let me actually jump back a couple of slides to the example document right here. So you see there's actually um, a prefix before the MD5 sum is one dash. So that, that number, that prefix always goes up incrementally. So any if I were to update spaghetti with meatballs, my revision would be called two dash something. And then if my, my wife were to update it at the same time, I wanted to add more salt, she wants to add more pepper. When she updates it, she would get two dash something else. So um, there's actually two parts of the, the direct answer to the question. Um, if that's all that happens, I update and I get two dash say one and she updates, she gets two dash two, then it just sorts alphanumerically and chooses the first one, two dash one. Now, as far as the MD5 sum is concerned, it's completely arbitrary. I mean, there's no, there's no relationship between the validity of that update versus the other update, right? It's just an arbitrary but deterministic way to determine a, a winner, an arbitrary winner so that a, a, a conflict resolution occurs. Now, if I update twice, suppose I add pepper and then I also add chili sauce. Now I'm at version three dash something, then that one would automatically win because it has a higher number than the two that my wife had. So in, in that sense, you could just start spamming updates to your database to, to ensure that you get the most recent update. In either case, however, CouchDB will, will, will flag that document as conflicted. Uh, and that's where that manual resolution can come in or, or you can automate it in your application. So in this Ebola example, uh, presumably uh, you would write your application to look for these conflicts and when they occur, it would prompt somebody to resolve them. So it, it would probably tell the doctor, hey, look, uh, patient A got this information and got this information. 
what do you want to do? How do you want to merge these or, or, or whatever? Um, so as far as the MD5 sum itself is concerned, th 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 there's nothing magical about that. It, it's just an arbitrary way, but a deterministic way to determine a winner. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So, so you've got a revision number and then for conflicts where the revision number isn't definitive, you've got, you've got a way of doing it and you can flag it. So in your Ebola example, but that makes a lot of sense. I was just wondering how that actually worked in, in a real world example. But, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. So photon uh, or futon, I don't know how this is pronounced. I mean, the old version was called futon, spelled like an actual piece of furniture. And then they rewrote it and called it pho photon, I, I guess. Uh, anyway, it's a web interface for CouchDB. So it's, it's kind of like your, uh, your PHP my admin or something like that. It's just a, a simple web interface to integrate, to interact with CouchDB. Um, it's on the slash, uti or slash underscore utils endpoint if you install CouchDB. Um, and there's an online visual documentation guide for anybody who's interested. Um, there are one, I mean two, I mean three ways to query data in CouchDB. Uh, the, the original version, the original way to query your, your, uh, your data with, with map, re, map reduced views. Uh, this has always existed in CouchDB, but it requires a certain amount of uh, uh, preparation. You have to build a map reduced view, um, which are, is written in JavaScript, by the way. Uh, you can still do that, but as a version of CouchDB 2, which came out now two or three years ago, you can use something called Mango queries. Mango is uh, intentionally spelled like MongoDB. It's, it's, a very, it's very heavily borrowed from the MongoDB query uh, language. Um, so it allows you to do arbitrary searches um, with uh, equals greater than regex expressions, et cetera, et cetera. And then new since version three, which just came out maybe a year ago or something, um, you can now optionally integrate Lucene uh, for full text search if you want to. So um, yeah, there's some really powerful ways uh, to, to do queries against CouchDB. Um, for mobile, uh, or, or web app, uh, development, there's also a JavaScript library called PouchDB. Uh, it's very closely related to, related to the CouchDB project, although it's not, CouchDB is an Apache project, PouchDB is not, but uh, many of the same people work on both projects. And it's essentially just a, a, yeah, a, a JavaScript client side version of CouchDB. It's, it stores data by default in local storage, although on older browsers it can use um, I, I don't even remember the, it can use, uh, what do they call that? Web SQL, I think. I don't think that's used anymore. Um, yeah, it stores the data in your browser and synchronizes, it uses the CouchDB replication protocol to synchronize with uh, your server. So if you, have, if you have the need to write a web application uh, that synchronizes, this is a great way to get started. In fact, this is the very reason I started with CouchDB is I was working on a proof of concept for a mobile app and I used CouchDB on my on my web uh, slash mobile uh, browser and CouchDB on my server. Um, CouchDB security model is a little bit limited compared to what you might be accustomed to, depending on which database you're using. Um, basically, you have per database uh, permissions, so you can specify, uh, and, and at, at each database level, you can specify basically read access, read only access. Um, sort of normal right access or admin access. Uh, and the, the difference is that admins can update indexes and views and stuff like that, whereas regular right access just lets you write and delete and update regular documents. So it's not a really fine grain control. If you need something more fine grained, you can write custom update functions in JavaScript that sort of, um, that, that they, yeah, they, they just do manual checks or, or not manual, but they, you can specify your own checks for when data is accessible or not. It's a little bit more complicated than a lot of people like to do, but it, it is available. And I think that is my last slide. So uh, you're welcome to reach out to me, by the way. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you to my website that has these slides um, and some links. And I'll put a link to the YouTube video when it's available, uh, assuming that I'm allowed to share that. I'm sure I am. Uh, and yeah, otherwise, you feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or, or uh, LinkedIn or wherever. And what other questions can I 
answer. I see one here. Does CouchDB support indexes? If yes, how does indexes perform for CouchDB as a data source JSON instead of binary? Uh, yes, it does support indexes. Um, uh, it, it's, it uses, yeah, I mean, it, it, it uses a B-tree index. Um, and how does it compare? So internally, I, I don't actually know the internal storage format. I don't think it stores it as literal JSON text on the disk. Um, but I don't, I don't know the details of how that data is stored on the disk, honestly. Um, but the indexing, of course, the indexes are not uh, JSON. The indexes are of, of some subset of, of that data. So yeah, typically what you do uh, is you create a view or, or if you use the, the, the mango queries I talked about, then the view is created for you automatically. But it, in the back end, it does the same thing. So essentially you have a, a view where you define that uh, for each document, um, I care about these particular fields. Uh, so, in, so index those fields. So, so at that point, it's just indexing those fields. Now you, you could potentially index an entire JSON object um, and it collates it then in, in the textual format of that JSON. So I, I guess in that sense, it's storing a JSON representation of those values in the index. Um, but usually you're gonna index on a text field, uh, say a date or, or an ID or something like that. And, and then, um, you, so you're, you're, not, you're not storing your entire document in the index. I don't, I don't know if that uh, answered the question. I, I hope so. Please, please ask. Yeah, me thank you. Yeah. yeah, good. Anything else? Jonathan, thanks for the talk. Um, does it any concept like locks in CouchDB and if it is there, how it's implemented there? Yeah, no, there, there really, really are not locks. Um, so the the only uh, the only sort of atomic operation in CouchDB is a document update. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, you, there's no reason to lock when you're only updating a single mm -hmm. a single document at a time. So if you need something like locks, it, it, suppose you need to update four or five documents simultaneously, you have it re requires a different uh, approach. Like maybe you update documents, uh, the, 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 the five documents, and then you update some pointer to those documents later uh, as the last result or something like that. So, you know, de depending on the application and, and what your exact needs are, there are sometimes ways to, to sort of do fake locking. Um, but internally, there's there's no there's no locking. And, and when you think about it, you know, especially when you think about like a distributed system across network connections, it kind of makes sense because you know there's there's no there's no application visible difference between talking to your local CouchDB server and one that's on the other side of the world, and maybe they're not even connected by by the internet right now. So you should be able to to communicate, do all of your talking to your local node, and then when they're both connected, they they synchronize. Uh, so if you needed locks, if you had locks, it would it would really break that paradigm. Thanks, Jonathan. Yep. Anybody what? else? Has a question what, while someone else thinking of a question, I just want to say, you know, I, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that most people will never use CouchDB. Uh, it, it's it's a fairly niche product, uh, but if you have a need for something like an offline first database. Uh, it, it could really be a, a lifesaver. I mean, I, I, on Stack Overflow, I see so many people asking, how can I do this replication on MySQL? Of course, the answer is you can't. If you need this type of replication, you have to use CouchDB. Dave had a new question in the chat. He says, uh, you mentioned an uptick in CouchDB popularity. Um, uh, the Ebola example was a great example. Is mobile application driving this? I expect so. Uh, I also think a big reason for recent popularity is new development activity. So, so CouchDB was stuck at version 1.6 for something like five years. And in that meantime, MongoDB became very popular. And then about two or three years ago, CouchDB development picked up again, largely due to support from IBM. Uh, IBM is one of the biggest contributors to, to CouchDB because uh, they, they, they host, they have a, a paid hosted version of CouchDB that you can subscribe to. So they've done a lot of work in providing some of their custom patches back to the open source project. So in the last couple of years, last three years maybe, CouchDB has had a lot of new development. Um, we added the, the, the Mango queries, which didn't exist before. We added the Lucene searching. Uh, 
And right now, the, the big work is on CatchDB 4.0, which is a complete rewrite of the back end to, to use a more efficient storage mechanism. Um, I can't really go into those details because I don't know them. But uh, yeah, the, the, the development effort that's been going into CatchDB has gone up drastically. And you know, with, with many open source projects, the more development effort goes into it, the more popular it becomes. Um, meanwhile, PouchDB, the, the JavaScript library, has been popular for a long time. I think a lot of people come to CouchDB through PouchDB. You know, that they're looking for how can I synchronize my my mobile app, and PouchDB comes up as a popular answer. So I, I do think mobile applications are a big driver. And a new question just popped up from uh, from Mike: um, How uh, CouchDB resolves update slash delete document co uh, collision? Should slash can it uh, uh, ID be restricted as unique? Great question. So the, the underscore ID actually is unique. It is the only unique constraint that is permitted in CouchDB. Uh, so uh, by, by default, yeah, any two updates to, a, to the same document ID uh, are, are considered a conflict. Uh, the way you resolve that is when you're doing an update, uh, you include the, the existing revision number in your update. So back, back on my spaghetti with meatballs example, Go back to that slide again. So if I wanted to update this and add, add pepper to my recipe, I would have to include that rev 1-917, et cetera, in the update. If I don't include that revision, if, if I either leave the revision out or I include the wrong revision, then I get a conflict error. Uh, so so what, that at least provides a guarantee that if my wife and I are using the exact same catch TV server, we won't have a conflict. But uh, since CouchDB is designed to run in a cluster, and by default, you get three nodes when you install a cluster. And probably with our cooking application, she's using it on her iPad, and I'm using it on my Android device or whatever. So we're not even on the same server anyway. That's when a conflict can arise, when we both do the same update to different, uh, different servers, and those servers later synchronize. Uh, so, so that uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, let me let me also comment on deleting. Uh, so, when you delete a document, you don't actually delete it; you just mark it as deleted. So, you leave behind this so-called tombstone that has three fields: it has the ID, revision, and an underscore deleted uh, field called tr that, that, with the value of true. So that what that means is that if my wife deletes spaghetti with meatballs on her iPad, meanwhile I added a bunch of stuff to make it a much better recipe then we have a conflict. And that conflict resolution process would be deciding, do we want the deleted version or do we want the version with new ingredients? And of course, how you solve that conflict is up to your application. 